I'm so glad uh, to be able to share with you again uh, this morning. Uh, the weather is so nice and the whole week the forecast is good. Uh, let us praise the Lord for this. Uh, the message that I want to share with you this morning is the church uh, is a temple of God. The church is the temple of God. Uh, the reasons for sharing this is uh, very simple. We are living in the end time. The Lord's coming is very near. And during this period, we must know uh, what the church is doing on earth. Why are we here? What is the intention of God for the church in the world, especially in today? And therefore, what should we do? When you look at the world today, there are many people who are against Christianity, and Christians are attacked. What attitude should we stand, what should we have in such a situation? During the last election, I was very upset on occasions by the then opposition party, the Labour Party, how they attack uh, Scott Morrison on his character, on this and that, always directly in a very personal way. I asked the question, is Morris, uh, 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 Scott Morrison uh, doing his job, is he true to, to, to God, trying his best or not? My answer is yes. Is there some way he could do better in terms of presenting himself? The answer is yes. Why they attack on him on so many occasions in this, uh, uh, what we call, unchristian way? Anyway, the election is gone by, the Labour Party got, uh, got into government. What we should do? What, exactly what we should do? We should pray for the government. For the Labour government now, that they should do, do, do well and uh, even do better than the, La than the Liberal Party uh, in the last government, if possible. This is a Christian attitude. We are not biased to one party or the other. But my unhappiness was due to the fact, from a standpoint of a Christian, how a person can be attacked. And. Uh, Religious discrimination law, for example. I was invited by the Attorney General to a uh, round table uh, meeting. And I know that from that point, from that, at that time, the legislation will not go through because very plainly the Attorney General said to about 25 of us, say, we don't have the number and they'll not go through. So uh, anyway, the point is that Christians are being attacked. You might experience it in your profession, in your uh, place of work. Uh, very unlike about 38 years ago when I first uh, arrived at this shore in, uh, in Australia. In those days, there was a great respect for pastors, but not so nowadays. So, we must know what the church is doing here. The word church uh, comes from the Greek word ecclesia. Uh, there are two words that combine the one, ek and kaleo. Ek means uh, out, kaleo means call. So it is referring to a group of people call out for a special purpose. And in the Greek society, the purpose is to make uh, to discussion, to a discussion, and then make decisions on some very really important subject. For example, another, uh, shall we say, um, nation state is going to attack us. Shall we defend? Shall we attack them first? What shall we do? And so the citizens will gather together to make a decision on such important matter. So the church applied to the word that is applied to uh, ecclesia applied to the church. What does it mean? It means a group of people called out from uh, thousands of people in the world by God to belong to Him and to serve Him. 
to accomplish God's purpose in this world through them. So it's a special group of people. So the church at Corinth is the same thing. The church of Corinth is a group of people called by God in that locality to belong to God to serve Him. So that is the meaning of the word church. But let us look at what well, the image of the church, for example, there are many images of the church in the New Testament. Uh, for example, uh, the temple of God, the body of Christ, the household of God. These three are the main one. Then there are hundreds uh, of other descriptions. Uh, for example, uh, the bride of Christ also refer to the church. Uh, and what we should know is that each one of them have a special meaning and, and a special uh, say, uh, area of teaching that is given to us. But first of all, look at the desire of God for his people from the beginning of creation to the days to come in the new heaven and the new earth, the new Jerusalem. What is the intention of God for people? Firstly, you see in the Garden of Eden, God made Adam and Eve. And his intention is to have fellowship with them. In the cool of the evening, Adam and, uh, will meet uh, Jehovah, the Lord, and have conversations. They will share with one another. There is a relation and fellowship going on. Perhaps Adam would be reporting to God uh, what he was doing that day. Today, I've done this, done this, done that, and uh, that one I find difficult, I don't know what to do. And God would say, now this is the way to do it, then you, uh, you accomplish your task. You know, they can share. God's intention is the Creator and the creature can have a fellowship and a relationship uh, from the beginning. And then you look at the, uh, uh, the next stage, say, the, the stage of the Israelites um, in the wilderness. The way they organize the tents is that they all surrounding north, east, south, west, but then in the center is the tabernacle of God. The tabernacle is supposed to be the place of meeting where God met with his people, not all of them go into the tent, no, no, special person can go in, but they meet outside. But the important point is God is in the middle, uh, as indicated by the tent, all the other tents are surrounding. Again, it is the uh, idea of fellowship. But we remember also in the wilderness, God is willing to be in a tent, to go along with his people. Because under the leading of God, when they move the uh, pillar of uh, uh, fire or light, they lift it, then uh, they break tents and then they go to another stage, uh, another area, and when they stop, the tent is in the middle. So it's God decided to be his people. And come to the temple, we all know that David wants to build a temple for God, but it was his son Solomon that he built for him, the glorious temple. Again, it is talking about God being in the temple. And the psalmist said, there is one thing I desire, that which I have asked, but I, I will ask again, and that is I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever, to view the beauty of the Lord and to learn and to seek him. And to, to talk to him. There's a temple. So a temple and temple, and then in the uh, days of the uh, exile of the Israelites, we have the synagogues, uh, a place of worship, very simple. You, you read the law of God, uh, you have prayer, and um, you have someone, like Apostle Paul, invited someone uh, to share some light on the scripture. And uh, they sing hymns, perhaps in the old, uh, the psalms, and so on. So it's a simple way of worshiping God, that God with His people again through the uh, reading of the scripture, particularly uh, going a stage further like that. And then the new Jerusalem. We talk about the end of time, the new heaven, the new earth, 
And what is so special about the new heaven and new earth? The speciality is because God said, I will be with my people. They will be my people. I will be their God. And I will wipe away empty tears. And there is no more suffering. What a wonderful uh, picture for us. What a wonderful place to go to. God and his people. During the time that we are on earth, we might want to be nearer to the Lord, but sometimes being humanly, being frail, our body may be aching, we have disease, and we're drawn near to God, and we find it very difficult. Uh, there may be our circumstances causing uh, pain and grief, and even the place where we work, we might just lose our job. And so, worshipping God, getting near to God, there are all kinds of hindrances, but in the days to come, all these will be taken away. God said, they will be my people, I will be their God, I will look after them, I will wipe off every tear from their eyes. So you can see the intention and the desire of God is that he should be with his people. Now, let us look at this image of the church as the temple of God. I would like just to uh, uh, use several uh, passages, uh, verses of scripture, uh, and uh, make comments on them, and then say what are the things we can learn. First of all, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 to 17. Do you not know that, you're, that you yourselves are God's temple, and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroy God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. Well, that is wonderful, isn't it? God does not only live in a building as the some is feel very safe and his greatest desire to be in the temple of the Lord already, the material temple built made of stones. But here the apostle said, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? You yourself, human beings who believe in the Lord, you should know this, that you are God's temple, God dwells in you, and God's spirit dwells in your midst. This is something wonderful. And then, if anyone destroy God's temple, God will destroy him. Well, anyway, I speak a bit too fast already. Another passage of scripture is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 to 22. Again, don't you know? Um, yeah, uh, sorry, there's another passage that is Ephesians uh, chapter 2 is talking about we are. I got it wrong in my, in my notes here, but I will give it to you. In Ephesians chapter 2, it's talking about the Israelites. Uh, they are the chosen people of God. God dwells among them. But then what about us who are not Israelites? We are, in the, in the Jewish way of thinking, the world, the people, the whole lot of people in the world only divided in two types. One is uh, you either an uh, Israelite or a Jew, the other one, they are Gentiles. What about this big group of people outside? The Apostle Paul says, don't worry, this group of people, the Lord Jesus died for you, that your sins might be forgiven, and now you're incorporated with the Israelites into a dwelling place of God by the Spirit. That is Ephesians 2, 19-22 telling us. But the lesson we can learn, I think a very simple structure of the sermon, scripture, application, scripture, application. Here the lesson we can learn. The first thing is, uh, talking about 1 Corinthians 1, um, about uh, uh, we are the temple of God, the first Korean passage, we can learn this. Uh, because God dwells in us as temple, we are his temple, Therefore, we should not have quarrels with one another, should not put one up against another. We should be united. This is what the Apostle says. 
in First Corinthians chapter ten, verse uh, chapter one, verse ten to uh, seventeen. He says that you should agree with one another. There should be no division among you. What is this that you say? Someone say, I follow Paul, and another person I follow Apollos, and another I follow Cephas, say Peter, uh, or someone say I follow Christ. And of course, I follow Christ. That is good. Everyone should be following Christ. Everyone should be following Christ. So this last one is correct in saying it, but the attitude and circumstances saying is wrong. What is implying? I follow Christ. You may follow anybody else, but I am following Christ. I'm better than you. There is divisions and uh, among them in that way. We all follow Christ. Should not have quarrels with one another, one another in that sort of way. And then the second point is that we must not destroy God's temple. First Corinthians three seventeen. Be careful with relations with brothers and sisters in the Lord, in the in the church. Be careful with brother and sister in the Lord in the in the, in, in the church. We should avoid gossips, sharing with one another what we have been doing, how we can encourage one another to grow in the Lord. That uh, they are all good, but avoid gossips, rather trying to destroy someone else. Uh, 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 reputation. Uh, that's why just now I mentioned about uh, the the, uh, the election uh, issue. It is so easy, and in other words, if we keep our heart pure and loving for other people, we will not be doing that. And remember, instead of uh, division in the church, we should have unity in Christ. First Corinthians ten, verse sixteen to seventeen, the apostle uh, says this, and today we have holy communion. It's not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks. Participation in the body of Christ. The answer is yes, and it's not the bread that we break. A participate in the body of Christ. Yes, because there is one loaf. We who are many are one body. For we all share of one loaf. Uh, our practice in the Liverpool Church in England is that we have only one cup and we have only one loaf. Uh, some people may say that it's not hygienic or anything like that, but throughout the years that I was there, nobody got sick because of the one cup and one loaf. Uh, anyway, we have uh, more than one cup and uh, the, the wafer is more than one loaf. That does not matter. This is the expression. The expression, the meaning behind it all, whether you have small cup, big cup, one cup or many cups, and the bread, uh, small pieces or one loaf, the meaning behind it is always one loaf and one cup. Because we are in Christ. In Christ we are one body. And the other application is that we have to be thankful in Christ the being built into with the Israel to be a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Okay, so that is the first one relating uh, to the passage we have read together. Now, the second verse I'd like to read to you is uh, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16. It says, What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. And God said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Well, the, uh, the, uh, the apostle is here uh, talking about uh, whether Christians and non-Christians should have relationship with one another. Definitely, uh, that we can have uh, um, shall we say, social uh, contact with non-Christian, uh, you can't avoid it anyway. Uh, and uh, in generally, in society, our relations with them, in the general, there should be no problem. We should have love in our heart, seeing other people uh, uh, use the eyes of Christ to look at them, and with love in our heart, they should be okay. But what he says here is about partnership, being yoked together, being yoked together. 
So the lesson we can learn is 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and verse 17, what it says to us. In, in uh, verse 14 of first Cor 2 Corinthians, uh, I think it should be 1 Corinthians actually, do not be yoked together with unbelievers, uh, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? And what fellowship can light have with darkness? Definitely, uh, there's no fellowship between light and darkness, and uh, no fellowship between righteousness and wickedness. The Apostle is using extreme contrast to help us to understand this verse. Being yoked together with non-believers, many of us would apply to marriage relationship. A Christian should not marry a non-Christian. Uh, well, um, and, and that is implied in this verse here. Um, the reason is between light and darkness, between righteousness and wickedness. And for the witness for Christ, uh, that is another uh, thing. Uh, that very close being yoked together should not be, but actually, not just marriage. Being yoked together also can imply a very close intimate relationship in a, uh, shall we say, business relationship. And I, and I would like to, uh, to uh, illustrate this by, in my, uh, by using my own life. When I was in Liverpool, there was a stage when my financial condition was uh, very low, was very bad. My uh, mother sent me uh, 700 pounds for me to buy a house. I didn't use it to buy a house, but instead I put into the business. And uh, the reason, a yeah, picking star restaurant business, uh, the reason for that is uh, I was financially low, I was worshipping in the church, and there was a sister in Christ who is a Christian, who introduced me to her husband who is not a Christian, and the husband wanted to open a picking star restaurant in Liverpool. And I, uh, without uh, income and so on, so I linked up uh, with him. And uh, I would like to say uh, there is a lot of sorrow and sadness. And, and struggle coming from what should I do in the business situation. And I will go into detail about that, they will take too long. But just to say, an equally yoke can refer to that kind of situation as well. And for marriage relationship, we better be, well, be careful. But someone will say, no, not, not necessarily true about this word being together. You look at so-so, he's a Christian and a married and non-Christian, and later his wife become a Christian, everything goes well. Well, that is due to the Lord's mercy, due to the Lord's mercy, rather than uh, his approval at the beginning. But uh, here are some of the things that we say. We know the Lord is very merciful. Even after making a mistake, if we pray, sometimes the Lord would help us and uh, forgive us, not only forgive us, but bless us. You know, are we willing to serve him, love him, and so on. So, that is uh, the, the thing I'd like to share with you. It says here, come out from them, in verse 17, and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean things, then I will receive you. They are very strong words. So, let us, uh, in this uh, intimate relationship with non-believers, let us be, uh, take, the note, take notes here. And then, seek holiness. Seek holiness. Isaiah 52, verse 11. When I was preparing this, I, I, uh, I was impressed by this verse. Isaiah says uh, to those who were in exile, what they should do is uh, depart, depart, go out from there. Uh, touch no unclean things, come out from it and be pure. You who carry the articles of the Lord's house. Who are the people who carry the articles of the Lord's house? The Levites, they were chosen to do that. So, uh, in today's, uh, uh, today's reference would be like those who serve in the church. Those who serve in the, in the church, for example, administrators. Uh, but then he said, come out from them and be pure. Because you who carry the articles, Lord, you, this group of people, you should be doing that, touch nothing and clean. So, those who serve in the church 
as administrators or as pastors to keep themselves pure before the Lord. And of course, it can refer to all of us as well, we should keep pure. And then draw near to God. Draw near to God. Draw near to God. Uh, because now, he got First Peter chapter 2, verse 4 to 5, there are two very precious verses. And we'd like to say a bit more on these two verses. Draw near to God. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Very important verse, very practical verse. The imagery is that there is a spiritual house, we call a temple, or spiritual, I mean more or less the same. Or, uh, God uh, is a dwelling place of God in the spirit, all talking about the same thing. And here talking about the Christian, what they are doing in the spiritual house. Jesus is the living stone. He is the one rejected by human, but he was chosen by God. Anyway, he is a living stone. Remember, living stone, not a dead stone. A living stone is, uh, has life. Jesus is a living stone, all right? He has life. God's living in him. I am in the Father, the Father is in me. The closest possible relationship between God and the Father. You also like living stones. This translation, I think, better than Chinese. You also, that means uh, we believe us in Christ. We are also living stone. I, in my mind, I think of this. He is a big living stone. So we are the small living stone. And we are being built into a spiritual house, into a temple. And what are we, what should we be doing in this temple? Uh, who are the people who serve in the temple? Priests, of course. And of course we are built in the spiritual house, serving the temple, we are priests as well. We are a holy priesthood. And what should we be offering to God? In the big temple in Solomon's day, they know exactly what they should have. Because if they lay down, it will come to God. You should offer this uh, a ram, a bull, a sheep uh, for sacrifice. Uh, for this particular occasion, you offer this. For that occasion, offer that. Everything is laid out very clear in that temple. But what about this temple? This temple just now is called a spiritual temple. God lives by his spirit in the temple. All right? And what can we offer? We are priests. We have to offer. What can we offer to God in this temple? Now, spiritual sacrifice, acceptable, and also through Jesus Christ. There are three things. What are they? Spiritual sacrifices that we should offer God. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 gives us the answer. And this is the most basic and important one. The apostle says, I urge you as a brother and sister, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Not a dead sacrifice, uh, uh, but a living one. And this living sacrifice, in fact, is your life. Jesus saved our life. We are going to give this life back to him as a sacrifice, living sacrifice. Years ago, many, many years ago, there's a little book, only one word, sacrifice. Little one, but very powerful. Hundreds and thousands of university students uh, uh, students of higher educational influence by sacrifice. See if in the day, see if you can find it, all right, uh, in the website or so. It is a marvelous book. It's talking about we should give our life to God as a sacrifice. 
which is holy and pleasing to God. And also says, this is your true and proper worship. True and proper worship is to offer our life to God and say, Lord, I thank you for saving me. This is my life for you. Not necessarily full-time ministry, but you live your life for him. If he wants you to go into full-time ministry, you go into full-time ministry. If he doesn't want you to go into full-time ministry, you just daily live for him. How I treat my wife, how I treat my children, how I go about in my daily work in the office, let it be a sacrifice to him. It is so important to realize this because it, 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 it changes our way of thinking. Uh, no longer just Sunday, I come to church to worship him, sing a hymn, put my offering into the box, uh, and then uh, leave home uh, to go back home and, and enjoy the rest of the day. No, we are to remember our whole life, wherever we are, whatever we do, let it be a sacrifice to uh, be sent it to God. Uh, and uh, well, secondly, the writer of Hebrews shall say in 13, chapter 13, verse 15 to 16. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Now, if you are not going to, to offer bulls and rams and sheep and so of God, what other thing can you offer to God? Because your salvation is freely given to you already. What, what can you give to God? He has the whole heaven and earth, uh, the cattle of a thousand, he will belong to him. What can we offer to him? Really, if you think about it, nothing. Just now we talk about your life, of course that one. Uh, they need to live for him, but there is nothing, uh, shall we say, um, that we can take to him and say, say, Lord, this is what I uh, give to you, uh, 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 a bar uh, of chocolate, a box of chocolate, <laughs> some food, uh, all right, or, or a chicken or something. Nothing. Because salvation is given to us free, which is the most precious thing, what we can give to God is the sacrifice of praise. Praise Him, thank Him, a thankful heart. Daily living a thankful life to God, that is your sacrifice. Um, so uh, to, to say, oh, praise the Lord, thank Him, whether verbally or not verbally, sometimes the not verbally is even more precious than verbally because the verbally part can become a habit of it so it just come out without thinking but in your own heart praise god for jesus christ praise god for the holy spirit praise god for the eternal life is given to us praise god for the new life is given to us praise god for the protection of the family uh, for the children, praise God for success in your uh, well, in, in place of work, not necessarily high success, but able to get on well with people and you enjoy your place of work and, and everything. In everything, have a heart of praise and thanksgiving to Him. Practice this. God is closer to you than a prayer or a prayer away, some people where God is so close, and it's only a prayer away. Okay, it is so close. We can all of us practice this. And then it says here, the, uh, do not forget to do good and to share with others. There are two things. To good, do good to others very often because other people have need and we help them out in their need is doing good. Uh, whether the person financially is not uh, have difficulty, uh, uh, do good. Uh, you help them financially. Uh, they need help moving the temperature, moving house. Uh, uh, you have a van, you help out, do good. You know? And then share with others, maybe material things, uh, maybe sharing of your thoughts. Uh, your your experience, your life, or whatever activity you have, share with others in the hope that the other person will be encouraged. Though these two things are very important too. Why? For with such 
sacrifice, God is peace. You don't, if you don't know whether you should uh, buy a packet of uh, chocolate or uh, a basket of fruit to give to God or not, but you know this one, whether God will accept or not, but this one is surely God will accept. Such sacrifice, God is pleased. Let me share with you a little story. Recently, I've been very, very busy. You know, so often is that when I finish something, the next thing will happen. And almost, I, I, out of the blue, not that I ask for it, it will, it will occur. On this occasion, it is within the BC period, it also occurred. Now, 30 year, 38 years old, came to Australia, and, uh, um, and uh, I did not know very much going on in the Liverpool church, although it was church, you know, I was a founder, and although uh, many years ago went back at the invitation to the 40th anniversary to preach to them, that was my great joy. But anyway, recently, because of the book that I've written about myself, it's in Chinese, so I didn't mention it here. I've written a book in the midst of all the difficulties. It's not I've written it. It is something very strange. Uh, someone I talked to when I was going to Canberra about my life and this person that you must have thought he was the founder of Christian Chinese Library. You can go to the website, you can see the very good organization. He said, you must write it down, you know, you can benefit other people. Um, and one day, about two years later, one day he came to my home with a sister in Christ, said them young down, Pastor, I told you about writing the book, share, you know, you share with others. She has a sister in Christ who will write it down for you in Chinese. My Chinese is not good, you know. So she will write it down for you. You talk to him. The name of the book is even got a name of the book already settled. He was the one, and so eventually, in the midst of difficulty, finished the book in Chinese. So, recently, there was a sister in Christ in uh, uh, Liverpool. I asked him through the email, would you like to have my book? I can uh, register for you and uh, send it to you. Uh, and then you can go to the website and get it. She said, I would like to have it, by the way. Uh, about 38 years ago, there was a certain student in our church, you remember him? He was studying medicine. He had finished his medical study, went back to Hong Kong, married uh, someone, and now has a son. The son is in New South Wales University doing the fifth year, the last year of medicine. Hong Kong situation is not bad and he wants to be with his son. He wants to apply for a job. Can you help him? <laughs> All that in one letter. Well, I know somebody who might be able to that. Immediately, I contacted another doctor in a, in a, a, a board of uh, management of the theological college. And he helped out by saying, this, this, this is what you should do. And then I contacted my nephew who is in Hong Kong, also a doctor, already migrated to Australia. I asked, please help him. And they have connected one another. An application is made to the uh, Australian uh, government and now is waiting for the uh, medical association or somebody to uh, give approval to come into this country and, uh, and uh, do uh, the work of a job as a as doctor. All this happened within a very short time. Why do I this? Why do this? It's because I remember, do not forget to do good. <laughs> yeah. That is, that is the thing. And, and so we should actually apply these things in our life and I'm sure your life is much more uh, rich, will be richer than before. All right, so now the, lastly, the Romans chapter 15 to 16, they, it reads like this. The, the Apostle Paul talk about himself. Uh, he said he was a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. And then he said, God gave him the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of Christ, so that the Gentiles may become an offering acceptable to God, sent, uh, they got sanctified by the Spirit. Remember, the apostle is talking about the Gentile as an offering he can offer to God. The Gentiles 
who believe in the Lord will become an offering by the Apostle Paul to God. So we're talking about human beings. But my point is not in this area. My emphasis is on priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God. All of us who believe in the Lord Jesus, we should proclaim the gospel directly or indirectly so that other people may come to know the Lord. But the point the apostle talk about is the uh, priestly aspect, the priestly duty. And I think of it in this way. What is a priest? A priest is someone who is responsible for the relationship uh, between those who come to worship and God, in other relation between God and, uh, and the believers, all right? Uh, is doing that kind of job. There is a priest. Uh, in the Old Testament, it's the same. New Testament, the meaning is the same. You come to God, the priest help you to get near to God through sacrifice or through prayer or whatever. Uh, so the pastor of a church is doing both of the gospel, proclaiming it, but then uh, doing it the, in a priestly way. That is what I want to say. How do we share the gospel with others? Is it sort of, here is the gospel, four spiritual laws, one, two, three, four. Remember that leaflet, four spiritual everybody use? And then we say, this is about Jesus. This is about salvation. I'm telling you now, it's up to you to whether accept or leave it. No, you cannot do it in that way. What we should do in the priestly way, be patient. A priest's quality is to be patient with sinners. You have to be patient. And then think of some way that you draw the person nearer to God. You may not be, uh, on, on the single occasion, bring someone to Christ. But it does not matter. Use it in a priestly way. You visit him, understand his situation, explain why it is like that as far as you can, and then talk about Christ, God's love, and hoping, even pleading, that the person can come to know our precious Savior. You have experienced it. You want him also to experience, him or her to experience it. This priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of Christ. I hope we, we can all do that. I'll, I'll close here. I got my notes mixed up a little bit and there. I hope you forgive me. Anyway, today we talk about the church is the temple of God. A temple is where God is. In Jerusalem, in Zion, God says, I will have a temple here, I will put my name there, I will be with your people. God's desire is to be with his people. The temple is like a with people. In the future, God will be the God of those who belong to him through Jesus Christ. And what we are to do as living stones, we are to offer spiritual sacrifices. And what I mentioned about how to offer spiritual sacrifices uh, is the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving because God done everything for us already. The presentation of our life, uh, sharing with others, and then uh, doing good to others. All these are what we do in the, as a, a descendant of God, are spiritual sacrifices. May God help us to do our work as priests in this living temple because God lives among us so that we may glorify Him and uh, really please Him by our life. Reward is great in heaven. An opportunity to serve even more will be greater in heaven. May God bless us and especially with good health in this difficult time. May God be with you.